the only shooting stick with one-handed trigger pull adjustments, has a new way to keep you at the top of your game. The Trigger Stick Apex, built for sturdy support that adapts to unforgiving terrain with easy adjustments to make your big shots. With our Durasteady three-piece carbon leg design and interchangeable rock-solid clamp, nothing tops the Apex. The Trigger Stick Apex, only from Primo's. If you hunt enough, you learn the truth. What you seek speaks a language and knows it well. That's why every Primo's call for everything you hunt is made the right way. We sweat every detail so you get more out of every hunt and nothing leaves our hand until we know it'll work in yours. Because we don't just make the world's best calls, we speak the language. Primo's. Welcome to the Casting Across Fly Fishing Podcast. I'm Matthew of castingacross.com, where I explore the quarry and culture of fly fishing. Before we get into the heart of this week's content on episode 289, a few administrative details for you. Uh, if you have any questions, if you have any comments, if you even have any accusations, do let me know. Matthew at castingacross.com. This is a good time to do it because next week's episode is an accusations podcast. So I interact with questions from listeners and readers. Uh, and so let me know, Matthew at castingacross.com. And if you don't get addressed on the podcast, I will do my best to get back to you in a timely manner via email. On a related note, if you've been enjoying the podcast for 288 episodes or one, and you enjoy what you hear, please take a moment to leave a review on iTunes and give us a rating. I would greatly appreciate it. All that stuff is great, and it leads to more interactions, which at the end of the day is really what I enjoy most about casting across. But today we're going to talk about gear and another gear podcast, but this one is kind of like a, um, a philosophy of gear podcast. Uh, have you ever had something break on you? Have you ever had to try to go and replace something while you're on the river? There's been a few times where this has happened to me, uh, where something has gone horribly sideways, and I've had to go and get a replacement. Thankfully, it's never been anything that has been too terribly expensive or necessary. Uh, I had a friend once who broke a fly rod while we were fishing, and he went and bought a new fly rod at uh, the fly shop in town, just like that. Thankfully, he had done research, and so even though it was a timely purchase, it, and it wasn't the kind of thing that he was intending to do, uh, it was something that he was ready to do. Um, I've, I've had to replace sunglasses. I've had to replace uh, entire leader and tippet setups. I've had to even replace uh, a lot of flies because I have lost a lot of flies. Um, but I always do my best to have things on hand. So I'm not put in the situation. Now, this is not a slight to fly shops. And I do appreciate the need, the, the ability to drive or walk to a shop and get those last minute things. Um, and I'm also encouraging you to pick up the things I talk about and that you may need from a fly shop. But when I go fishing, I want to go fishing. I don't want to go shopping and fishing. I don't want to, I certainly don't want to do research on my phone and then go shopping before I can get back to fishing. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about backups. What do you have that you have in duplicate, maybe even triplicate? What do you have that you bring with you? And now you may have a completely different philosophy. You might like to be totally minimalist and only buy when you need and uh, live in that adventurous moment of if something is lost, broken, or forgotten, you just go out and get a new one. And that's part of the experience. Personally, I like to cut down on the variables by planning as much as possible uh, because there's been times where I've gone to fly shops to get X and they don't have X and they're the only fly shop around. Or I go to you know a big box store and uh, I, I get a very subpar version of X because uh, that's all that they have, but I need it to keep fishing. And so that's what we're going to talk about today is what should you get duplicates of? What should you have on your person? What should you have in your car? And what should you just have waiting for you at home? So here's a great example. And we'll just go to the top of the fly fishing food chain. And that's a fly rod. If I am going fishing for a full day, if I'm not close to home, then I have my backup fly rod in the car. Now there's times, and I'm finding more and more frequently, if I'm fishing places where I can, I'll carry that second rod with me. 
completely strung up and ready to go. If I'm fishing the salt and I have nothing around me, nothing to, to get in me or my rod's way, I always have a second rod rigged up with a popper uh, that's in my belt. That way I don't have to stop, switch up flies, and uh, tie on something new when I am seeing some fish blitz, especially because I want to have a floating line on that on that rod and not what I usually use, like an intermediate or sinking line for most of my fishing when I'm on the shore. The same is true for larger rivers where I like to carry a second rod for, you know, set up for streamers or nymphing rod or something like that. But take that out of the equation. Uh, I always want to have a second rod in the car in case something goes wrong with my first rod or in case I really think that that second rod is going to be a better fit. So a, a great example would be if, if I find myself fishing streamers um, all day, I'm probably going to put that eight and a half foot five weight. That's more of an all around rod away and get that uh, six or seven weight out and start fishing that more or worst case scenario, something explodes and I'm able to go into my car and get another rod and I can lick my wounds, but I can do it while I'm fishing. Now, whenever I'm fishing, like I said, far away from home, or I'm going on a multi-day trip, I want to have a couple of rods with me. Now, I understand that not everybody wants to own multiple rods, but it's not that uncommon. And this is where I would say there is some, you know, forethought and some deliberation that would go into this. It is not a bad idea to have, you know, the three weight, the six weight, the nine weight, or the two weight, the four weight, the six weight, the eight weight, whatever it might be, you know, plan things that way. But if you're going to have two rods that are effectively filling the same niche, it's not a bad idea to consider one as a backup for the other. So that's a great example. I, I usually carry an eight and a half foot five weight and a nine foot six weight from most of my medium to large river trout fishing. And based on the day, the weather, the flows, then one is going to be on the river with me. The other is going to be the backup in the car. And I can make that split, you know, uh, really not split second decision, but that decision kind of last moment as I'm driving to the river and I start thinking about what I want to do. And then that other rod becomes a perfectly suitable backup, but I'm going to have it in the car. It's not going to do me any good at home if I'm four hours away um, or even just an hour away. And so it's in the, the car and I keep it there safely. Now, just a quick note on keeping things in the car. Always keep things somewhat um, ob obscurely uh, hidden. <laughs> you know, don't don't keep things out in the open. Now, there's some places where I'll keep things out. There's a lot of places where I fish in Pennsylvania where there's just so much foot traffic and so many people, and there's so many you know people walking their dogs and and bird watching and stuff like that. Where I'll leave things out. I'll have my rod strung up just kind of in the back of the car. But for places that are a little bit off the beaten path, I try to keep things a little bit inconspicuous. Uh, that's why I've stopped putting uh, fishing stickers on my car as well, because uh, a car with a bunch of fishing stickers um, is essentially a uh, a a billboard for where to find some expensive stuff that you can either use or, or hawk on, on a, at, a, at a pawn shop. Anyway, uh, so that is a, a kind of a, an idea when it comes to fly rods. So it is not a bad idea to plan your purchases and then plan keeping you know something in the car for if you need it. So now what about something a little bit uh, less uh, uh, pivotal? Uh, and, and that would be fly line. All right. Now, I love fly line. And I think fly line is very, very important. So what do I do with fly line? Well, I like to have a second spool in the car at any point in time. Now, this is where kind of line and reel come together. So I like to have a second spool of functional fly line with me at all times. Now, this might not fill the exact same need. So, for example, my six weight reel that I've got, uh, you know, just next to me right now, ready to go fishing, has a floating fly line that I'm going to use almost all the time. But then I also have a very low density, uh, what's that, low high density, I guess you could say. It's a sinking, a uniform sinking line that I use for streamer fishing. So, I'm going to carry that with me if and when I want to throw that on to fish streamers. If something catastrophic were to happen to my fly line, I wouldn't be out of luck. Or if something catastrophic were to happen to the spool of that reel, I wouldn't be out of luck. Now, these are very unlikely situations. Now, to be fair, the last major gear failure I had was a click Paul reel had a spring bust. And so it was effectively free spooling the rest of the day. So it wasn't the worst thing in the world, but it, it wasn't something I was able to fix. Now, given I was deep into the, the back country, it was like four or five miles in, and it kind of was what it was. I wasn't going to carry an extra reel, reel with me as I was you know, going back into the woods. 
So it was fine. But having another spool in the car, or if you're doing a lot of hiking and you're, you anticipate needing a second kind of fly line on your person is not a bad idea. Um, I generally don't carry a backup reel uh, for for a same rod. So as I mentioned before, five weight and six weight in the car under normal trout circumstances, but I have a reel for each. Even though they take the same reel, I have a reel for each. So I have one reel for each, and then I usually have at least one spool for each reel also. So two spools, so two lines, so four lines total, two reels, two rods. Just kind of gives you a picture of, of the the planning that at least I employ. You might have a totally different plan. But what that allows me to do is not only switch up my line on the fly uh, without it's no fun to re to despool and respool on the stream uh, as far as taking it all off and putting it all on. Okay, popping that that spool off of the reel and putting a new spool on is a great way to diversify your angling opportunities. But it also, like I said, gives you a backup for when you if something catastrophic were to happen now that rarely happens but when it does happen when you maybe you get a a snap which your line is probably in terrible condition if that happens but while you're fishing you notice that it's not floating well or there's a bad kink in it or there's even a place where that pvc that plastic has peeled away and that fly line now needs to be replaced if it's so terrible that you have to replace it then you go and get your other spool from the car but what I like to do is have a backup line at the house. That way I'm ready to go whenever I come home. It's not going to help me if I'm on a four-day fishing trip. But when I get home from that four-day fishing trip, then I'm able to just replace it right away. Now, is there anything wrong with waiting until that happens before you buy a new line? No, not at all. But what I like to do is find lines that I like. And then when I see them on sale, when I see them on closeout, when I when you know that line company is re upgrading or replacing that line in their product line, then I will go ahead and buy a spool. And it, you know, if it's a $75 line, get it for 50 bucks or get it for even cheaper than that and just hang on to it. You keep it out of the, the extreme heat, you keep it dry and it's going to be fine waiting for you. Um, is that a little bit, uh, a bit, uh, overprepared? You could say so, but for like my five weight and my six weight and my eight weight and my three weights, the lines that I use a lot, I like to have a backup on hand, just ready to go, especially if I can find a line I really like at a good price. So I don't carry like an extra floating five weight fly line in my car, even if I'm going for multiple days. But if I'm going to have a whole other rod reel line set up and I'm going to have an extra spool for the reel that I'm primarily using, that gives me some options if something catastrophic were to happen. Now, speaking of catastrophes, there's a much better chance it's going to happen with your leader and your tippet. And this is where, again, maybe a little bit overprepared, but it's for small money and it doesn't take up a lot of space. So I have a well-stocked leader wallet on my person, whether it be my backpack or my vest or my sling pack at all times. And in that leader wallet, there is at least six knotless taper, tapered leaders of different lengths and diameters. I kind of like having like a, a seven and a half foot three X and then like a nine foot 5x and then like a nine foot 7x for different applications uh, at any point in time. I'm not using that 7x stuff as much that I'm up in New England back when I was in Pennsylvania. A lot of 7x was was in uh, being used on the Spring Creeks, but having those there, I'm able to use them at any point in time. Now, there's other podcasts and other articles on castingacross.com that go over why I use knotless tapered leaders. I love them because they give me a great building block, particularly when I am on the river and, and instead of having to build a leader from scratch I for all intents and purposes have a very serviceable tapered butt section and then a functional uh, tippet section on the end of that on leader so I may very well clip off three feet of that nine foot 5x leader and then using my tippet build out something new but I have something that is very very functional in case maybe that knotless tape that knotless um it's not knotless, but it's a loop to loop connection. Say that that snaps on my leader or I get a really bad tangle and I'm just assessing it and say, you know what? I'd rather put a new one on than spend 15 or 20 minutes getting this thing undone. Or I realize, you know, that something's brittle, something's nicked up. I got dragged against a rock. It'd just be better to change that out using a loop to loop connection and or, or a nail knot, which I carry a nail knot tool in my tippet wallet as well. 
excuse me, my leader wallet. And what else is in that leader wallet just for fun? Well, I've got some uh, wire in case I come across some toothy fish. I have um, tippet rings. Uh, I have poly leaders and they all stay in the same place. And I label everything because everything looks the same once you take it out of its package. Um, usually what I do actually fun little, you know, this is hardly a hack or a tip or anything like that. But say you get a, a package of knotless tapered leaders and they come two to a pack. Uh, what I like to do is snip off the bottom inch. And so, for example, I've got some Orvis uh, super strong leaders in front of me. And at the bottom of them, it gives the um, not only the diameter, uh, but the, the X rating and the length. And so I snip that off and it creates a little pocket. And then I keep them in there and slide that into the little sleeve of my leader wallet. And now I know exactly what is in uh, that sleeve. So I like to have at least three different uh, knotless taper leaders on my person in case something were to go sideways. Now, similarly, unless you take the time to take the little spool keepers off of your tippet spools and peek at those all the time, then it's probably wise to carry some extra tippet. Now, I don't carry extra tippet on my person. I keep a spool of spools in the car. It's a big, chunky stack, 0x to 7x. And obviously things like three, four, and five get used up much quicker. Um, but I like to have that in my gear bag. You know, that's where all the random stuff is. That's where I keep the super giant streamers I'm not going to carry on the water. That's where I'm going to keep those extra spools I'm not going to carry on the water. That's where I'm going to keep the headlamp and I'm going to keep the first aid kit and all that sort of stuff is going to be in this bag. And that's where I'm also going to carry a spool of spools of tippet. That way, if I go to pull off, you know, uh, another arm's length of 4X and all of a sudden I only have three inches in my hand. Um, I can either make a decision at that point, jump up to 5x, keep using 3x, or walk back to the car, grab that 4x spool, and continue to do what I want to do. Or if it's on a multi day trip, you just fish out the day using what you have. And now for tomorrow, I don't need to go to the shop to go buy a spool of 4x, potentially at a really high price, and maybe not the brand that I want to use. I'm a little bit anal when it comes to using the same brand of tippet and, and, um, and leader because then you have consistency across the x ratings and uh, as well as the texture, supple nature of the, of the line, etc. So as you can tell, I really don't keep a lot of things on my person for backup. But in that bag, along with the things I just mentioned, there's another pair of nippers. There's another pair of forceps. Um, there's going to be some extra flies. I don't like carrying every fly I own on the water. I like to carry boxes with my high percentage flies. And then I've got, you know, the, the just all the random weirdo dry flies that maybe uh, I, I bought, you know, a half dozen of for a certain hatch, but I'm not going to use them under normal circumstances. So I have a box of that kind of stuff that's going to be in the car also. Uh, like I said, the giant streamers, you know, all the egg patterns, San Juan worms, things that I don't fish a lot of, but I have a lot of might have a few on my person and then a bunch more in, in the car waiting for me. Now, this gear bag, I don't like leaving in my car because there's things in there. Oh, you know, more floating, more split shot, all that sort of stuff. Um, it, you know, things that you can really easily assess uh, how much floating you have on your person. You can look at that, how much split shot you have. Well, keep a second bottle and a second tin in your car in that gear bag so you're ready to go. Um, and again, you're not you're not uh, circumventing the fly shop. You're just being proactive with the fly shop. So that kind of stuff goes in the gear bag. Uh, then there's some things that I'm not even going to necessarily bring with me. So unless I'm going on a multi-day trip where I'm really, really far away, I'm not going to bring another pair of wading boots. I'm not going to bring another pair of waders. In fact, there's a very good chance unless I'm going somewhere really far away, you know, Kamchatka, which hasn't happened. And if any listeners are interested in, in sponsoring Casting Across, then do let me know. And I will be happy to go to Kamchatka. But I'm not going to bring a pair, an extra pair of wading boots. And I'm not going to bring an extra pair of waders. I will have in that gear bag an extra pair of boot laces. And I will have in that gear bag a um, UV uh, resin kit to do repairs on my waders. And I'll always have duct tape with me, which you can use in tandem with that uh, UV repair kit in, in case things get really bad. But I'm going to have those things at home because I have different things for different uses, the ultralight boots versus the more heavy duty boots. And if my heavy duty boots were to poop out on me while I'm fishing, then when I come home, I can switch to those ultralight boots and be fine with those until I go ahead and replace those really heavy duty boots. So even though I have multiple pairs of waders, I'm not going to bring them both with me, even if I'm going on like a multi-day trip. I'd rather just save that space, 
and have repair gear if I need it. Now, could I break all of my rods, get holes in all of my waders, and lose all my flies? Maybe. But I'm pretty confident that that's not going to happen. And if it does, circumstances are so dire that I probably am okay with just going home at that point. Now, a few more words on like the philosophy of, of what I'm talking about here. Now, this is a great way to build out your gear. If you have just started in fly fishing, buy things that might occupy a little bit of a different niche in your fly fishing. It, there's going to be some overlap with that five weight and that six weight or that four weight and that five weight or whatever it may be. Um, but in doing this, you're able to kind of build out what you have and also use things more frequently. I mean, don't buy a uh, eight weight just to buy an eight weight. You know, if you're not going to be fishing for bass, you're not going to be fishing for salt water and you already have a five weight anything. Well, what should I buy? It's not wrong to do something a little bit derivative in function. And then if that's still, if you really love your five weight, you have a really nice one and you're thinking, yeah, I'd like to have a four weight for use now and again, then that's great. You can use it when you have the opportunity to fish a little bit lighter, but then it also is a great serviceable backup. Another benefit of this is you start to accumulate gear and you do so in a purposeful manner and it's able to kind of complete your entire loadout if need be. Now, when you take someone fishing, whether it be a, one of your kids or your friends or whatever, they can use all that stuff and, uh, and, and enjoy it. And you're not going to have to go out and buy a bunch of everything and say, yeah, you can use, I've got backs, backs, backups of everything. Feel free to use it. So that's another great reason to, to get into that stuff. And what I also like to do is switch it up use some of my backup gear every now and again. Every once in a while, I find that, I mean, little things like forceps and nippers and, you know, knot tools and fly boxes. I'm like, you know what? This really has a lot of value. I like using this. Maybe I can incorporate this into my fishing a little bit more. And then another thing is if you get to where you're fishing quite a bit, then you can actually create an entirely different loadout and say this bag and this gear is for when I go fishing for trout on large rivers. This bag and this gear is when I go fishing for trout on smaller rivers. This is for my smallmouth stuff. This is my large mouth. This is my whatever. And you're able to create kind of different bags where your other bag is still there and it's still available, but it's just got the backup stuff. It's your primary gear for application A and it's your secondary gear for uh, application B and vice versa. So that's another th way to think about accumulating gear. You're not doing it simply for the sake of getting more stuff. You're doing so with intentionality and you're doing so with purpose. So that's just a broad overview, a couple of my thoughts uh, that has to do with maybe what might be worth carrying with you, what might be worth leaving in the car, what might be worth leaving at home, why you might want to buy something over something else. If you have any thoughts about that, questions, comments, do let me know, Matthew at castingacross.com. This weekend, Casting Across, uh, the Monday's article is actually called Ready to Fish with a Second String Line, where I kind of talk through uh, in a little bit more detail and a little bit more succinctly at the same time, if you can believe it, um, how, how I do this with line, leader, and tippet. And so there's an article about that and backing for that matter. If you're interested in how much backing I have, uh, I allude to it in this article. Uh, well, Wednesday's article is called Rod Flies Thermometer. There's a question mark at the end of that. And I talk about some of the uses of having a thermometer with you. Uh, we all know that the thermometer is primarily used by people, at least as it's encouraged that you use it, to determine if the water temperatures are such that it is not safe for you to fish, that it will put undue stress upon the trout if you fish over this particular temperature. And that is a very good reason to carry a thermometer, but it is not a unitasker. There are other things that you can do with the thermometer, and I talk about those in this article. I think four of them, actually, four different things. So check that out, Rod Flies Thermometer, and that's over at castingacross.com. This week's recommendation on the podcast is actually for something that I don't own, but my children do. And uh, it is the Bass Pro or Cabela's. You can get one from from either you know branding uh, catch all gear bag, the catch all gear bag. And it is a great bag to do what I've talked about today. It's 20 liters, which, you know, what does 20 liters mean? You're not going to fill it with water. But uh, if, if you know backpack sizes and things like that, then it's a decent size for throwing a lot of these small things. And it has a few things that I like. 
One has uh, four side pockets, or excuse me, three side pockets, and actually one on the top, so four, um, that you can keep kind of ec small stuff in, and it's not going to get lost or obscured in the main pouch. It also has a nice shoulder carrying strap as well as a hand carrying strap, so you have lots of options on how to move this thing from point A to point B. Anyway, you can get things with a lot more bells and whistles and from a lot fancier brands, but for 13 bucks, you would be hard pressed to find something more functional. So I'll put a link to the Bass Pro Shop version. I think the Cabela's ones has them in camo, but uh, definitely worth checking out. My boys use them for they have, each have a couple of them. That's got like their airsoft stuff in it and they use one for fishing and uh, it's it's actually they don't have all the fancy uh, fly fishing gear like I do. And what they have works just as good. So definitely check that out. Thanks for listening to the Casting Across Fly Fishing Podcast. Please subscribe to your favorite podcast app and rate the podcast on iTunes. Then head over to castingacross.com for three posts a week on the people, places, and things that go into the pursuit of fish. that has the stories to back it a life to be proud of it's a winchester life yeah baby six eight western oh, i'll be over there baby right there tune in every tuesday at 7 p.m eastern on waypoint tv